This series will cover some of the basic principles of genetics and how these principles were discovered. It will cover many of the most significant experiments, from Gregor Mendel's work on plants which discovered the laws of inheritance to Thomas Hunt Morgan's work on fruit flies. It will cover the history of DNA research from its initial discovery to the elucidation of its structure by Watson and Crick to the modern day world of genome sequencing. Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species in 1859 in which he outlined his theory of evolution by natural selection. Although his theory was perhaps the greatest breakthrough in the history of biology his theory was incomplete. He didn't know about the mechanisms of inheritance and DNA had not been discovered yet. His theory relied on the fact that different individuals in a population differed from each other but he was unaware of what caused this variation. In the middle of the 19th century the Augustinian monk Gregor Mendel did breeding experiments with pea plants in which he studied the inheritance of seven different traits. These traits were flower color, seed color, seed shape, pod color, pod shape, stem height, and flower position. The pea plants that Mendel experimented with are capable of self-fertilization. Mendel self-fertilized his pea plants for many generations to create true breeding strains. In a true breeding strain the trait being investigated stays the same from parent to offspring for many generations. The pea plants he used are also capable of cross-fertilization where the male gamete from one plant fertilizes the female gamete from another plant. In one experiment Mendel crossed a true breeding strain that always produced smooth seeds with one that always produced wrinkled seeds. You might expect that some of the offspring produced from this cross would be smooth and some wrinkled but this is not what happened. Every single pea produced from this cross was smooth. Mendel followed up this experiment by taking the offspring of this cross and self-fertilizing them. This time not all the peas produced were smooth. Most of the peas were smooth but some of them were wrinkled. It seems very unusual that a smooth pea plant being self-fertilized could produce wrinkled peas. The wrinkled trait had skipped a generation. When Mendel counted the thousands of peas he found that the number of wrinkled peas was almost exactly one quarter of the total. So what was going on in this experiment? Why did a trait disappear only to reappear in the next generation and why did the traits display a 3 to 1 ratio? Mendel came up with a hypothesis to explain this. His idea was that each trait was determined by two of what he called factors. Today we call these factors genes. Each pea plant inherited one of these factors from each parent. Mendel also came to the conclusion that there were different forms of these factors. For the factor that determined seed shape there were at least two different forms. Today we call these different forms of a gene alleles. For the gene that determines the seed shape in Mendel's pea plants there is an allele that causes the seed to be smooth and another allele which causes the seed to be wrinkled. If an organism inherits two copies of the same allele for a gene that organism is said to be homozygous for that gene. On the other hand if an organism inherits two different alleles for a gene it is said to be heterozygous. One allele can be dominant over another allele. A dominant allele is expressed whether the organism is homozygous or heterozygous for that allele. An allele can also be recessive to another allele in which case it is only expressed in the homozygous state. In the case of Mendel's pea plants the smooth allele was dominant over the wrinkled allele. This explains the results of Mendel's breeding experiments. Mendel had created true breeding strains of peas one of which was homozygous for the smooth allele and the other was homozygous for the wrinkled allele. When he crossed these two strains all the peas that were produced were smooth. The peas that were produced must have inherited a smooth allele from one parent and a wrinkled allele from the other parent since both parents were homozygous. This means that all the offspring of this cross were heterozygous containing one smooth allele and one wrinkled allele. This cross can be represented with what is called a Punnett square. Using a Punnett square we can use the genotypes of the parents to determine the genotypes of the offspring that will be produced. An organism's genotype is its genetic composition. An organism's genotype as well as its environment determines its phenotype which is the combination of its observable traits including its physical properties as well as its behavior.
The peas that Mendel worked with are diploid meaning that they contain two sets of chromosomes having inherited one set of chromosomes from each parent. Diploid organisms produce haploid gametes which contain only one set of chromosomes. The male and female gametes fuse together creating offspring that are diploid. In our Punnett square we can represent the smooth allele with an uppercase S indicating that it is a dominant allele and the wrinkled allele with a lowercase S indicating that it is recessive. Above the square we write the possible genotypes of the gametes that the male can produce and on the left we write the genotypes of the female's gametes. In this case the male plant has a genotype big S big S while the female has a genotype little s little s. Since each plant is homozygous all the gametes that the male plant produces will have a smooth allele and all the female plant's gametes will have a wrinkled allele. In the boxes of our Punnett square we write the genotypes of the offspring that will be produced when the two gametes fuse together creating a diploid zygote. In the top left box the offspring will inherit a big S allele from the male and a little s allele from the female. In the other three boxes we get the same result. All the offspring of this cross were heterozygous containing one smooth allele and one wrinkled allele. Since the smooth allele is dominant over the wrinkled allele all the offspring had a smooth phenotype. What about the next experiment Mendel did? What caused the 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio? Let's do another Punnett square to find out the genotypes of the offspring of the second cross. In this case the male plant's genotype is big S little s and so is the female's. Each plant will produce 50% big S gametes and 50% little s gametes. In the top left box the offspring will inherit a big S allele from both parents and will be homozygous dominant. In the top right box the offspring will inherit a big S allele from the female and a little s allele from the male making it heterozygous. In the bottom left box the offspring will inherit a big S allele from the male and a little s allele from the female also making it heterozygous. In the bottom right box the offspring will inherit a little s from the male and a little s from the female making it homozygous recessive. Our Punnett square predicts that one quarter of the offspring will be homozygous dominant and will therefore have a smooth phenotype. Half the offspring will be heterozygous and since the smooth allele is dominant over the wrinkled allele these offspring will also have a smooth phenotype. The other quarter of the offspring will be homozygous recessive and will have a wrinkled phenotype. Our Punnett square predicts a 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio and this is exactly what Mendel's results showed. Based on these results Mendel proposed the law of segregation which states that each organism contains two alleles for each trait and that these alleles segregate during the formation of gametes so that each gamete contains only one allele. If an organism is heterozygous for a gene then half of the gametes it produces will contain one of the two alleles and half the gametes will contain the other allele. Mendel also investigated the inheritance of multiple traits in his experiments and was able to determine if inheriting one trait affected the inheritance of another trait. For example does a pea being yellow make it more likely to be smooth as well? Does a pea being green make it more likely to also be wrinkled? Mendel crossed a line of true breeding smooth and yellow plants with a line of true breeding wrinkled and green plants. The color of the seeds is represented by big Y for yellow and little Y for green showing that yellow is the dominant allele and green is recessive. This first generation is called the P or parental generation. When he crossed the two lines to create the F1 generation the progeny were all smooth and yellow. This was consistent with his previous results. Next he took the F1 plants and self-fertilized them to create the F2 generation. Since the F1 plants were heterozygous for the two genes being investigated this is called a dihybrid cross. The different genotypes that were produced are shown here. If traits are inherited independently of each other it can be predicted that for every 16 peas produced there should be 9 smooth and yellow peas, 3 yellow and wrinkled peas, 3 green and smooth peas and 1 green and wrinkled pea. Mendel obtained the results shown which were very close to the ratio predicted if the traits were inherited independently of each other. Based on this data he formulated the law of independent assortment. As we will see in a future video this law does not always hold true. Now that we have covered the basic concepts let's try to use them to solve some problems. The following problems were taken from the textbook iGenetics by Peter J. Russell.
In part A of this problem we have to work out the appearance of the offspring when a tomato homozygous for the dominant red allele is crossed with one that is homozygous for the recessive yellow allele. Let's use a Punnett square. We will call red big R and yellow little r. We put the gametes of the male at the top and the gametes of the female to the left. All the gametes produced by the male will have a big R allele and all the gametes produced by the female will have a little r allele. When we fill in the boxes we find that all the offspring produced will be heterozygous. Since red is dominant to yellow all the tomatoes will be red in appearance. In part B we have to work out the appearance of the next generation of tomatoes. Since both of the parents in this cross are heterozygous 50% of the gametes that they produce will have a big R allele and 50% will have a little r allele. In the top left box the offspring will inherit a big R allele from each parent. In the top right box they will get a big R allele from the female and a little r allele from the male. In the bottom left box they will get a big R from the male and a little r from the female and in the bottom right box they will get a little r from both parents. Only the offspring that are homozygous recessive for the yellow allele will be yellow in appearance and the rest will appear red. Our Punnett square predicts a 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio. In part C we are crossing one of the F1 plants back to the red parent. The F1 plants are all heterozygous and the parent is homozygous dominant. When we fill in our Punnett square we find that half the offspring will be homozygous dominant and half will be heterozygous. All the offspring will appear red. In part D we are crossing one of the F1 plants to the yellow parent. The F1 plants are all heterozygous and the yellow parent is homozygous recessive. If we fill in a Punnett square we find that half the offspring of this cross will be heterozygous and half will be homozygous recessive. Half the tomatoes will appear red and half will appear yellow. Let's do another question. In this one we can work out that the colored allele is dominant to the colorless allele since there are three colored plants for every colorless plant. The plants will therefore have the following genotypes. Since we are only picking which plant we will self-fertilize from the colored plants we can ignore the colorless plants. Out of the remaining plants two-thirds will be heterozygous and one-third will be homozygous dominant. If we pick a homozygous dominant plant to self-fertilize all the offspring will have the same genotype and will be colored. However if we picked a heterozygous plant some of the offspring will be homozygous recessive and will be colorless. Since two-thirds of the plants we are selecting from are heterozygous the probability that we will pick a plant that will have colorless offspring is two-thirds. So the answer to our question is two-thirds. In future videos we will look at more complex patterns of inheritance that have numbers of offspring that are different from Mendel's predictions. Thanks for watching.